rose from the dead by the power of his spirit to go to stone away and go on back to life. We have woke up this morning and we have gathered here because of all the things that you've done for us. And we come now to offer to you our praise, our worship, to give afresh our lives to you. And we ask that as we spend these few moments together, hearing scripture, singing songs, giving offerings, and listening to your word, we pray that you would fill this place with your presence. We ask that you move up and down every week, and that you touch each and every person who's here today. And for those who were not able to be with us today, and who may be worshiping with us online, we ask that you would, would just be especially close to them to meet the needs of their lives. And now as we continue to worship, we're here, Lord, and we're waiting and we're listening to you to speak. Jesus well, let's stand and sing our praises in hymn number 319, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. We'll sing all four verses.
I brought to you myself to play it out of words. Have you guys ever played a game that's called, I'm going to try and say it in a second, but I'll let you look at it. That's a, that's a, that's a long word. That's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen letters. I'm not done. That's a lot of letters in the word. We don't need the verse that time. We when I grew up. I'm going to see if I can say it. Apple did the last scare of the new sort of like that. Have any of you listened to anything? That's interesting. Have any of y'all ever played the game I would see? Yeah, you do. I would see. You know, I think more. Somebody's in. And then the other folks, what they're you gotta go and hide. And the person that's in will swap. They count to like sometimes it's a hundred. And they count, and then they open their eyes, and they gotta go find everyone that's in. They go seeking to find the ones that are hidden before they come back and touch face. And whoever's the first person to get down, that's going to be the next person for the next day. I see. It's a game that's as old as this one. Because this is some theory was where it originated in Greece. And this was found in uh, some literature back in the second. Uh, century, uh, long, long time ago, many, many years ago. So I'm six on a new thing. Miss Janice is going to read for us a couple of some verses from the English, a prophet of the Old Testament. And I just want to read one verse that she's going to read for us. And it says, Seek good and not evil that you may live. I am seek. You go looking. For some. Amos said, We're to seek, we're to look for good, not look for good. That's always trying to always look for good. That's good. So, God, we thank you for our children, we thank you for the chance to come and to think of these moments of the high and seek. And we want to seek good.
the things that are happening in our world. But Lord, you already know the Holy Mission. You've already provided the power of your spirit to those who put their faith and trust in you, in Jesus, your son. And you promised to be with us and that we don't have to worry about anything because we can pray about everything and we can tell you what we need and that you will hear our prayers and answer our prayers. So we pray for our world. We pray for our country. We pray for our city. We pray for our neighbors, our families, our friends. We pray for those that we don't even like. Help us to be a witness to everyone of, of how you work in people's lives when they see Jesus in our lives. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, who rose from the dead, sits at your right hand, and is coming again. In Jesus' name. Amen. When I stepped up 
accepted the pulpit at Antioch Baptist Church in Centerville, Alabama. Well, in case you're wondering what I did, do you want me to tell you? I tell you what, I told my favorite story. I told a story that when I first read it, it just stuck with me. And I've shared it over and over for years in various places. When I told the first time, I was 18 years old. I was a college freshman. Uh, I went to Sanford University in Birmingham, Alabama. And we had a program where ministerial students on the weekend would go and preach at local churches in Alabama, here in Birmingham, Alabama. And so I got the opportunity on September 15, 1974, to go to Centerville, Alabama, Metropolitan Centerville, Alabama. Uh, I spoke that morning. I felt like I was good. <laughs> and I spoke, and I thought, man, it feels like I have spoken. I spoke for an eternity. Well, after it was over, I looked at my watch. I spoke about less than 10 minutes. <laughs> well, before you get all excited, <laughs> I've spoken a few times since then. And I don't think I've spoken 10 minutes or less since then. So I, I don't think I'm going to speak for 10 minutes. Now, I'm not going to speak like one service I went to one time when I said, I said, boy, I went to a service, a revival service, and that fellow preached and preached and preached, and he preached a long time. I'm not going to do that this time. So I'd like to tell you the story that I told you in 2021. I'd like to tell it to you again. Because there's a phrase at the end of that story that I want us to think about today for a few moments. And it actually is rooted in the scripture that we're going to read in a little bit. The story, the name of it is The Uncut Pages of Life. And here's how it goes. One day, a boy came to his father and said, Dad, it's about six weeks before I... I'm going to college. And I was wondering if you were thinking about giving me a going to break here. And if you are, I've got a suggestion. One of the fathers smiling answered. He said, well, so what's your suggestion, son? Well, his eyes sparkled. He said, Dad, could you find... This is an old story. It said a second-hand forward. In case you're not familiar with that phrase, second hand, it was a used car he was asking for. Dad, could you find a, a used Ford? One that I could take me, the one that would take me to college. Still, still smiling, the father replied, Well, how about, would you ever have a brand new Well, the boy almost passed out. Dad, could, could I, is it possible to have a brand new Ford? Could you afford it? Well, the father thought for a minute and he said, Well, maybe you can, but I'll, I'll not promise you definitely today. The next time, when the father came home from work, he called the boy into, he came and, uh, and was sitting in his chair, he called the boy to come over, and, 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 he, and he said, he, he brought the boy a book, and he gave the boy this book. But the interesting thing about this book, Pages weren't cut. They did not cut the pages. And he told his son, he said, I really want you to read this book. Now, what you're going to have to do, because the pages are cut, as you read a page, you're going to have to cut the page to get to the next page, and so forth and so forth. You've got to cut each page as you read it. So the boy went back to his room and said, Oh, yeah, I'll be glad to read that. I'll read it, and, I, and I'll get right on So he went back, he read a little bit, a little bit. They actually went by, and the boy came to his dad and he said, uh, By the way, Dad, not to be a festival, but uh, have you thought about the car? And the dad said, Well, how are you coming on the book? Have you finished the book? And, and, uh, and the boy said, Well, I've read some, I've got some more to go. So he went back and read some more. Well, this went on several times, week after week after week. <coughs> Finally, it's the night before he's leaving the book out. And the boy comes up 
Jews there. He said, get out of the Jews. No more to say. I thought he might get a call. And I just can't believe it. I tried to be a good son. And, and I just had to be disappointed. And I did it. And my father asked him, son, can you finish the book here? And he said, no, I got just a few more pages. He said, read the He brought in the book. You probably guessed what right. The father took the book and he cut the last page. And after that last page, so the check made up to the local four day. Well, it wasn't. That was close. <laughs> he cut the check. He's all excited. And then all of a sudden, he thought, I can't do this. He regret that. He said, I don't deserve it, Dad. I don't deserve it. The father brought him over to him and told him this. And this is what the, the this is the whole point of the story that I want to leave you with. The father said to him, son, we miss a lot of things in life when we leave uncut the pages of life that we ought to cut. Did you hear what the father said? We miss a lot of things in life when we leave uncut. The pages of the life that we fall to cut. One day Jesus said something similar. He was talking to a bunch of religious folks, scribes and Pharisees. In the New King James Version, Matthew 23, 23, he gives these words of recorded the words of Christ. This is Jesus talking to these really super religious people. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, where you pay tithe on mint and ants and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others. Undone. Tithing was very important to the Jewish faith. It goes back to the, the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. They were, the children of Israel were taught the word of God taught them that they need to get 10% of, of, of their crops to the Lord. And it was universally accepted to, to do this. And these scribes and Pharisees, they were giving 10% of even their spices. <coughs> I'm not a little bit of a I'm a little bit, but I've never used, I don't even know if I'm even saying it right, uh, ants, A N I S E. Cumin, I heard that next to me, so for mint, I avoid mint, so I know I wouldn't be using mint. I don't know what that would be. I'm not a big mint person. Um, but to put it in language we can understand today, it's like they were doing 10% of their salt and pepper. Uh, and that's what they were giving to God. And they were thinking, oh, look at us. We're, we're religious. We're super religious. Not only do we tie like we're supposed to, but we can go to the extreme of tithing salt and pepper. And instead of giving them a pat on the back, and say, man, you guys are good, well done, good, and faithful servant. How did you tell those folks that? What he said to them was, whoa, you're a bunch of hypocrites. You're so far down in this minute, meticulous act that you miss the big picture, the obvious, the weightier things of the law, the, the, of justice and mercy and faith. They were doing things they did not need to do and not doing the things they should do. They were majoring on the minor and leaving the most important things undone, things of justice, mercy, and faith. They were leaving uncut the pages of life. This morning, I might first look at a couple.
I would just like to say, let's, let's kind of define, what's the very first characteristic? If you were to name a couple of characteristics of God, what would you expect to be like probably the very first characteristic of God? Any ideas? Somebody go ahead. Amen. Okay, I'm in all knowing. That's definitely one I'm thinking about the first one. That's definitely one. Love. He's definitely love. I'm simple, I'm simple reminded of an all. Yeah, that's, that's good. I'm still a little bit, little bit more. We used to say it at work at the 30,000 foot level. How about all the power? What do you expect God to get all power? If there was anything that God could not do, how in the world could God do that? Right. Gotta be all powerful to do You wouldn't expect anything else. And we have the Bible from page to page, cover to cover. It's example after example of things that God did that makes you scratch your head. I don't know how he did that. They parted the Red Sea. And he was with his children, the three boys in the father's furnace, and Daniel, and Paul, and Paul, and Paul. How Jesus. Uh, just last week, I think we were talking about last, uh, a couple of weeks ago, last week, coming out of a grave. Dead, stone cold dead. And Jesus, the Son of God, said, Come out. God is all powerful. So, whatever excuse we have why we cannot do something for God, it really doesn't make a lot of sense because we're saying that you God can do everything except whatever our particular excuse is. But you need to be not helping other folks. I like the story. Let me just do a question. Okay, let me give us our hearing. Yes, I believe God can do everything and we need to help our neighbor. Well, you know, you know the story. Jesus was asked the question. There was a young religious leader who thought he was really good. And he said, he said, okay, I hear you. God, he quoted the verses I just quoted to you guys. This religious leader quoted those to Jesus. He asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, 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 uh, and then Jesus asked him a question and and, and he said, well, you've got to love you under all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, and love you with both yourself. He answered correctly. But then the religious leader kind of wanted to get himself off the hook. He finally had a day out. He said, well, by the way, Jesus, who's my neighbor? Because he wanted to pin, pinpoint it down so that he could loose it around. Who's my neighbor? Well, so Jesus told the story. You know the story. Let me, just, let me give you the need. Uh, in the script It's found in the Luke Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Jesus said, one day there was this fellow, this guy, he was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. I think I saw that on the news this week. Somebody attacked by robbers and beat up and half dead. You may have saw it every night this week. It's going on all over the place. So this fellow, he gets beat up, he gets robbed, he's half dead on the side of the road. And Jesus goes along with the story and says, a priest. Let's just say a preacher. Happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw a man, not like he missed seeing him, he saw a man, he passed by on what? The other side of the road. I'm not going to ask anybody here if you've ever seen somebody leave and pass by on the other side of the road. It's not good. Not good. Not good. So 
Ruth and Levi. Maybe this guy was a deacon, <laughs> or a Sunday school teacher, or choir member, or somebody in the church, or an official of the church, a committee member, or chairman, or whatever, or some committee. He comes down the same place, and he saw that. He saw that. No excuse, he saw that. And what did he do? He passed by on the other side of the road. <coughs> but then there was a Samaritan. Now, a little bit of historical background here. Jesus was a Jew. Samaritans were hated by the Jews. Those folks did not get along together. And so we could today take any class of folks that are hated by other folks. And that would be who the person was that got beat up. In the, in the context of the New Testament, it was a Samaritan. And he came where the man was. So he came to the same spot. Third person after the same spot. When he saw him, he saw him too. Third person seen him. Look what happened. He took pity on him. And there may be a bunch of us that have done that. We looked at somebody and taken pity. Man, man. That person was really that tough. And we've taken pity on him. And then notice what happened next. He took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wound, pouring oil and wine on him. He, he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to him in and took care of him. And the next day when he left, the man left, he left money with the innkeeper so he could keep taking care of him. And he told him, if you spend any more, I'll reimburse you for the whole amount and come back. So Jesus asked that religious fellow, who do you think the neighbor is? And that fellow said, to him, well, the one who had mercy on you, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The second paragraph is love for others. We're called to love others, to go and do likewise. That's what we're called to do. We're to show God's love by helping others. And then the third paragraph on this uncut page of love is to drill it down and look at for the word of love our fellow Christians. Now, others is everybody. You're another, I'm another, we're all others. When we drill it down into one more step, we are, not only are we all others, but we're here as Christians worshiping God. So, how are we going to love our fellow Christians? For Jesus in John 13, 35 said, Your love for one another will put to the world that you are my disciples. If you love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. The person that has no love is still good. And I haven't noticed it in our church. And maybe just because I just haven't noticed it. <laughs> but I've been in churches before. Uh, where there's been a lot of dissension and a lot of uh, fighting, fussing and feuding and fighting over various things. And it seems to me that the church is the last place in the world where there should be dissension, unforgiveness, bitterness, hard feelings, and on and on I could go between the Christians, between the Fellowship. Now notice, I was very careful not to say disagreement. Because sometimes we've got different opinions. Somebody had a different opinion of what, of what I think we should do. And we have a different opinion of what somebody else should do. Disagreements and differences of opinion are, are, are not unusual and not wrong. But it's how we take those differences and what do we do with them. We need to take them to God and find a way to, to work together and come together when there's a disagreement and a difference of opinion over something. And we need to see not the will of this person, not the will of that person, not the will of this idea, not the will of that idea. But we need to 
come together and what will should we be seeing? The will of God. The will of God is what brings us together. We should, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we come together with differences of opinion and we seek the will of God together. We love each other together, even though we may disagree sometimes on the chicken. Well, that last love, that's a big page. It's three paragraphs long that we need to cut. We need to have a cut page of the last love. Let me just give you two quick ones. The second uncut page is a, is a tame tongue. I'm not going to call for testimonies. <laughs> but I know you guys want to get home before Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. So I'm not going to call for any testimonies of this. But an uncut page of a tame tongue. You know where I'm at. James chapter 1, verse 26. If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself. But if that weren't enough, this is what I finished up with in James 1, 26. And your religion is worth it. Claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue. You are fooling yourself, and your religion is worthless. Let me just take the obvious. You know, there's, there's, there's two types of speech: there's negative and positive. Negative, you know, you so it's like critical tongue. Well, they can find the wrong in everything. Then you got some folks that have a gossiping tongue. I'm going to tell you a story. I went to a time, I didn't type it in, I read it, just read it, but I want to put it here and discuss it. I can't help myself. You have to forgive me. I read this story. I don't think it's a true story, I think it's a funny story. I read this story, and there was these three creatures. And they're out fishing. And so they're out there having a good old time fishing. And And we get to talking about, you know, brothers, we, we should, I feel like we should confess our sins to each other. And so one preacher, he confesses a sin that he struggles with. The second preacher confesses a sin that he struggles with. The third preacher didn't speak up. The other two guys said, okay, it's your job. What? What sin do you want to confess to us? He said, well, he said, I've been a gossiper all my life and I can't wait to get home. <laughs> so gossip each other. Just about something may be true, but not everything is true needs to be said. You know, we can keep some stuff that's true to ourselves. A gossip time, no place for it. Negative. Uncut page of the tank But then a positive, well, why would it be negative and don't need to be positive? Well, two very simple things. How about an encouraging? If somebody ever just out of the blue giving you an encouraging word, then you're going to make you feel a little bit better. Maybe there's a compliment about something. No, thank you. Good. A complimentary term. Somebody complimented you on some hard work or an achievement or something that you did. Positive term. That's the cut. That cut the, tank, the page of the tame time. We need to not be negative, but positive in our speech. We all learned it. Words, uh, ones that sticks and stones will break my mouth for words and words. That's a lie. It's not true. Words do hurt. Let us cut that page of the change. And then the last page, real quick, is the page of the winning witness. You need to uncut the page of the winning witness. Acts 1 8, that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and from the ends of the earth. We witness for Christ by our words and by our walk. 
You can have the word, and the words can share the words of Christ, but it can be like this. It would be like a fellow trying to sell a Ford SUV to somebody, and he pulls up in the driveway and he's shit. Well, if you're driving a shit, you why should you really drive a shit? You know, our walk needs to match our words. The way you walk. Roy Robertson was the first missionary that was sent out by a group called Navigators in the country, the Christian ministry. And he tells a story from World War II that changed his life forever. His ship was in West Virginia, and it was docked at Pearl Harbor on the evening of December 6, 1941. That night, he joined a couple of friends and attended a Bible study. And about 15 sailors sat in a circle on the floor. The leader asked each one of them to recite a favorite Bible verse. In turn, each sailor shared a verse and a brief comment about the verse. Roy was towards the end of the line. He was sitting there in terror. He couldn't recall a single verse. He'd grown up in a Christian home, went to church three times a week. He sat there terrified. He couldn't think of a verse. Later that night when he went to bed, he was thinking, Robinson, you're a fake. At 7.55 a.m. the next morning, he was awake and knew he was waiting for him. That was, that was uh, December the 7th, 1941. He was awake the next morning at 7.55 a.m. when the ship's battle station of Armanau, 360 planes from the Japanese Imperial Fleet were attacking Pearl Harbor. He raced to his machine gun. He had, he had, and he got to his machine gun, and all he had was practice and mission. So for 15 minutes of a two-hour battle, he fired blanks at the Japanese. You have to think of Robson this is how your whole life has been firing blanks. Christ. I don't know about you, but there may be someone else here this morning, and you might be feeling like you've been fired for us. For Christ. Maybe you've never given Jesus complete control of your life. Maybe you've not surrendered your will to his will. Well, today is the day you can go up and supply and mission. You can give your heart to Christ. You can rededicate your life to Christ, no matter old, young, or young to And you can uncut that page of a way with us. One day, some religious folks came to Jesus and asked him a question about what was the most important commandment. And Jesus said, said to him, Woe well, to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! When you pay tithe of men, man doing them and neglected the way your manners of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Let's take our hand a little. And turn to hymn number 660 now. And sing, O oh, Master, let me walk in the In number 660. <laughs> Thank you. 
on Friday, May 19th, um, we'll have a bunch of very excitable uh, fourth and fifth uh, kindergarten through the third graders uh, running around outside here. Um, and if that's your thing, please come on out and help us. Um, even if your thing is not hanging out in kindergarten or third grade, but you're going to be staying along Royal Avenue and helping them not go into Royal Avenue, um, <laughs> that, that, that is a gift that we can use. Um, for those of us that kindergarten through third grade is our thing, we're going to have a bunch of, uh, and it's your thing, we're going to be having a bunch of fun games for the kids in the school year. And then the following Thursday, I know you can work for Royal Avenue, well, then that's 6 to 8 p.m. And the following Thursday, um, or Thursday, May 25th, that's the final day of school for Warren County Public Schools. We've invited the fourth and fifth graders um, who will be very excited uh, to come on over and we're going to put out for them to spot all the handlers. Um, they'll be running around and doing well. So if, if you're if you just want to come and enjoy the cultural experience, <laughs> um, please come to us. Um, and if you want to see why I do what I do for you, um, come on by. And afterwards, if, um, well, we'll figure out afterwards. <laughs> but that being said, we'd love to have you. Uh, it's a good job for everybody if you can make it. Uh, if not, pray for those of us that do make it. And especially the kids as they finish out the weekend. Uh, and do pray for our children right now because you know, Avery and, and, and Dee Dee, they're, they're still having a certain mess of us this week. Um, they're staying in the black class. So. A lot of pressure and a lot of stress, but these are very much so. Just keep all that good. And the last time you noticed is the family picture week on the 4th and 6th, you ran? On June the 4th, you're going to want to mark that on the calendar's house. Let's stand for our benediction. God, as we leave this place today, help us to cut all the uncut pages of life that we need to cut. Fill us with your spirit. Give us your strength. Guide us, direct us, and show us how we can be your hands and feet in this community. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's Amen. Yeah.